Hello and welcome back for another SIBO myth-busting session with yours truly, Dr. Danessa, gut microbiome queen. And today we're going to be talking about the protein consumption, hydrogen sulfide production link, nay, controversy? Well, we'll see as the video progresses. So to catch you up to speed a little bit, remember there are three types of gases that we talk about when we discuss the microbes and what they produce for us and in the context of SIBO. So we've got the classic hydrogen SIBO, methane SIBO, also known as EMO, and the relative new kid on the block that is hydrogen sulfide SIBO. Now, it's worth mentioning here that you can also have just run-of-the-mill hydrogen sulfide dysbiosis, and you could be overproducing this compound in the colon as opposed to the small intestine. But I don't want to get lost on this. I think that either way, it's kind of like emo in my opinion, either way you're going to treat it kind of the same way. And the link with protein is what I wanted to cover today. Because when you go into the SIBO forums and you go digging into other YouTube videos, you will see this link talked about quite a bit that you need to drastically reduce your protein, particularly animal-based sources of protein, so that you can starve the SIBO bacteria and you're not overproducing hydrogen sulfide. And there actually is a little bit of truth to that statement. There is some research linking increased amounts of protein consumption to hydrogen sulfide production in the gut. So what are we to do? Does this mean we all have to be vegans? Does this mean we all have to be on a low protein diet? I would say no. And if you think about it, there's plenty of examples where this is not going to be the case. If this is the case that high protein diets lead to hydrogen sulfide production and these symptoms, then why doesn't every bodybuilder on the planet have hydrogen sulfide SIBO? Right? There must be something else about the microbiome or the health of the host or the diet that is contributing to this or mitigating this effect for some people to get away with a very high protein diet per, for a prolonged period of time. So Remember with nutrition, you can't take something totally in isolation and ignore the rest of the context of the diet. I would argue the same thing for health, right? That's the whole idea with holistic healthcare. You can't just take out the GI tract, examine it, treat it, and ignore the context of the rest of the individual in front of you. And unfortunately, that's what ends up getting done in the world of SIBO quite often. People hyper-focus on the gut and they ignore everything else to the detriment of the poor person who has SIBO. Now, going back to diet for a second, though. So we are tempted oftentimes to pluck out this one part of the diet, protein, or maybe high sulfur foods like red meat and eggs. We're tempted to pluck that out of the diet and say, here's the bad thing that we have to eliminate. And we're not talking about the rest of the person's nutrition that is contributing to this balance. And I'm going to show you one paper that I think really demonstrated this beautifully with one other nutrient that I think gets a bad rep in the SIBO universe. So let me put myself in head bubble mode. Hold on. Okay, so here's the paper that I just was tickled pink to find. So this is a 2023 paper, Impact of Diet on Hydrogen Sulfide Production, Implications for Gut Health. And they said, recent studies support a positive relationship between dietary protein intake and hydrogen sulfide production. See, there is some research to support that link. However, protein rarely exists in isolation in the diet, and dietary fiber intake could reduce hydrogen sulfide production in humans and animals, even with 30% of calories derived from protein. Now, quick math lesson here. If you are assuming that you need about 2,000 calories a day, which is fairly standard, I'm six feet tall and about 190 pounds, and that's right about what I need on days that I'm not physically active. Um, if you are consuming a 2,000 calorie a day diet, 30% of your calories from protein means that you are eating 150 grams of protein per day, which is a lot. Like At least in my humble opinion, personally and professionally, 150 grams of protein a day is a lot of protein. So what they're saying is that, yeah, you could get up to like 150 grams of protein a day or 30% of your calories from protein if you have the dietary fiber to balance that out. They continue on though. They said, these findings suggest that increased fiber intake may reduce hydrogen sulfide production irrespective of protein intake, enabling the ability to meet metabolic demands of the host while supporting gut health. 
wicked cool. Because here's the thing, protein is necessary for life. You can't be on a low protein diet indefinitely forever. It will bite you in the butt eventually. So the idea that we have to take away the protein is oftentimes not only not true, but it's potentially dangerous if that person wants to be healthy in the long run. They said in humans, total fiber in grams, insoluble fiber in grams and carbohydrate content reduce hydrogen sulfide production. And here's another one, right? Here we are saying, oh, we need to demonize protein in this case because of hydrogen sulfide. But then in the SIBO universe, we oftentimes demonize fiber and carbs, and people think that they need to be on this low-protein, low-carb, low-fiber diet, and it's like, what, what else is left? Just drinking olive oil? There's nothing left. Fiber's the answer, my friends. And then one more quote. The effects of dietary fiber intake on hydrogen sulfide production may be partially because of their anticipated effect on increased short-chain fatty acid production. Higher content of short-chain fatty acids in an in vitro fecal slurry fermentation model resulted in lower pH and reduced hydrogen sulfide and the relative abundances of bacteria that promote hydrogen sulfide production. In addition, dietary fiber deprivation was found in a mouse study to result in increased degradation of mucin, which increased release of sulfur substrate for hydrogen sulfide production. So here's the thing. Let me get out of head bubble mode. Okay, so here's the thing. The bacteria are smarter than we are. I've been saying this for a long time. And for that matter, I think that yeast and other critters are smarter than we are. If we think erroneously that we could starve them of their substrate for a prolonged period of time, they are smart enough that they're going to find something else. And in the case of hydrogen sulfide, you have plenty of sulfur for the grabbing in the mucus layer of your gut. And that mucus layer is very, very important for protecting your gut and keeping you separate from not you, aka your microbiota. So by all means, if this is something that could be a very short term band aid for a week or two, occasionally this has benefit. Now I'm talking more so about people with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's where this tends to be a more effective band aid in my experience. But I beg you, please do not go on a low protein diet or a low sulfur diet for more than a week or two. There are other answers, fiber, carbohydrates, probiotics, prebiotics. There are so many other answers for hydrogen sulfide that will allow yourself to nourish your body, keep your sanity, quite frankly, and promote long-term health instead of just a short, simple Band-Aid solution. So please, by all means, eat the protein, but balance it out with carbs and fiber. As you can tell, there's a lot of nuance and context that goes into helping somebody develop a treatment plan that's going to be right and effective for them. No two of you are the same, no matter what your diagnoses might be. If you have the same five diagnoses as the person sitting next to you, I guarantee there are going to be differences in what is effective for each of you. And I do my best to provide information here on YouTube that's going to be broadly applicable and broadly helpful. I try to bust some myths and reveal the truths of the matter. But it's not about the knowledge and the learning for a lot of you. It's about how do you execute this information in your day-to-day life and how do you apply this knowledge that you now have? And that's easier said than done. And in my mind, that's more of what FODMAP Freedom is about. Yes, there is lecture content and I teach you a lot along the way, but a lot more of FODMAP Freedom is the group Q&As, the coaching, the support, the emails and us being able to be there for you, hold your hand along the way, and help you understand what is relevant for you. There might be a lot of information in the SIBO universe that you do not need to pay attention to, and it would be such a relief off your shoulders to just chop that off the chopping block and never worry about it again. But how do you know? How do you know if you need to worry about something like histamine, or hormones, or detoxification, or bile flow, or stomach acid? right? Like there's only so much you can gather from free YouTube videos and podcasts and summits. But this is the sort of thing that I help you understand in FODMAP Freedom. I lead you through a journey and I help you assess yourself along the way. And then we will come in and help you and give you our opinion as well. And at the end of the program, you should have a really good idea of what you need to do and what's going to be effective for you. And you probably will be feeling a heck of a lot better already, even after the 12 weeks has ended. 
So if you want to learn more about FODMAP Freedom in 90 Days and when we're enrolling again, go ahead and check out the link down below. You could join the waitlist now. And then when we enroll again in April, you will get a super sweet bonus gift as a thank you when you enroll early. And you'll be able to reserve your seat ahead of everybody else before I make a general announcement here on YouTube or on Instagram or anywhere else. So go ahead, check out FODMAP Freedom, join the waitlist. There's no, there's no commitment by joining the waitlist. You just let me know that you want to know when we're enrolling again. But come over to the dark side. We have gluten, we have cookies, we have garlic, we have onion, and it's a pretty happening place to be. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.